errant when there are errors. Uh, they can identify stations that are off. So it, it's a beautiful marriage, it's taken completely for granted, but I think it's one of our big accomplishments is weather forecasting. The question is, can we do the same for climate? And I would claim climate is about to become as exciting as weather forecasting in the 50s. There are certain basic questions. What's the simplest world in which you can have ice age? Very basic questions have not been answered. And I think that it's going to be up to the youth, but I think the whole business of climate studies, at the moment, you have paleo people who take a holistic approach, basically tell you stories of what happens in sequence. And then you have modelers whose, whose models reproduce the climate of today. They've been tuned to do that. Why do you have any confidence in their results for some other climate? Right? Unless we can explain things like the ice ages, I don't see much reason to have all that confidence in the climate models. Uh, so, this in, in summary, you have seen this before. Let's go to the next one. Uh, so I want to get the last part of the talk. Oh, I have 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Uh, science has limitations. And it's mute. You, you cannot live your life with constantly questioning everything. Right? You, you have to have some beliefs. Uh, and it guides you on how you act in certain political, social situations. And so I would argue the method of science are inapplicable to social situations. And the a person who's written very elegantly about this is, is Isaiah Berlin, and he's an Oxford philosopher. He lived through the 20th century, and at, at some point he poses the question, if at the beginning of the 20th century, say the year 1900, if you asked historians to anticipate the next, the two big developments of the next 100 years, they would have gotten one right and one wrong. Uh, what they would have gotten right is enormous technological scientific advances. They may not have anticipated laptops, or cell phones, but they would have anticipated that electricity will be there. They, electricity was becoming commonplace in the early 20th hundred. Advances in communication and medicine and so transportation. They would have gotten that part right. Any guesses as to what they would have gotten wrong? Basically, Berlin proposes it's the rise of ideologies. Uh, nobody would have anticipated the rise of fascism, communism, the Nazis, apartheid. And he claims that there's a connection between these two big developments. That science is so spectacularly successful by employing a certain method that you may be tempted to think that the same method will, is applicable to social problems. And the method is basically a completely uncompromising one. You form, there are certain laws that govern natural phenomena, and ruthlessly, without any compromise, you implement these laws. And you, if you say that 2 plus 2 is 6, and I say it's 8, we don't agree on seven is the compromise. There is a right answer, a wrong answer. And so he is, but then argues that this is exactly where people such as Stalin or Hitler go wrong. They think that they've discovered the laws that should govern human behavior, social behavior. And anybody who disagrees is impeding progress and you should eliminate them. And so they, Mandela's opponents took it to crazy extremes with apartheid. They believed that all social problems can be solved by segregating everybody. And they claimed they had equal but separate facilities was not the case. Uh, it's led to the second major development, the ideologies to where today we have religious fundamentalism. In the 20th century, it led to the deaths of tens of millions of people. Okay, and it was simply, they behave like hedgehogs. Right? If you behave like a fox, you consider all possibilities, which is what Mandela is. Uh, you have to consider all sorts of alternatives. 
so if we, it's basically what I just said, science solves problems that have objective solutions. They're independent of race, religion, gender, age, ethnicity. Science cannot solve problems that depend on those factors. So in, in, in the French Revolution, you could say people formulated the laws that should govern our lives. They were, you find it inscribed on buildings. They wanted uh, liberty, freedom. Uh, in principle, it's fine. Should you put the wolves in charge of should the powerful be given freedom to exploit the weak? Uh, you may want justice, but you also want compassion. Uh, the solution to social problems is all about compromise. You, you need compromising, compassionate, and charitable attitudes. Uh, these factors play no role in scientific problems. So it's a, a major mistake to think that you can approach the social world in a strictly scientific manner. As I said, there are many benefits to learn about science, but uh, it's important to keep in mind science has limitations. And uh, I, I spent some time in South Africa recently, and they're very keen, everybody wants to be a good guy, and they're very keen on global warming, and that we should, highest priority is to stop burning coal. It's not an easy decision in South Africa. The, the economy depends on keeping the mines dry, and keeping the mines dry depends on burning coal. Uh, should they sacrifice their economy? They, it's, it's a poor country, a major problem. The other thing I became aware of is, is this one, that you, you cannot tell poor people who have absolutely nothing, they don't know where the next meal is coming from, you cannot tell them the future is going to be worse. You have to give them some hope. And so what is the appropriate response to global warming given such a state? And so I just want to impress on you, global warming is why I started out saying it. It's, it's not uh, something that can be left to scientists. It involves very ethical issues. Uh, this question does not have a scientific answer. Uh, it, it's, it depends on your values. It depends on how much compassion. So today in, in this country, we're very divided politically. It is about basically about issues such as this. What is the responsibility of the state of us collective? There is no easy answer. We need to accept there is no easy answer. Uh, the debate about global warming should not be about whether it's reality or not. Uh, we have to reduce CO2 emissions. We have to do something. The debate should be about how we best proceed to do this. Okay. And there's a variety. So it, 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 we're having a very stupid argument at the moment where people question the science. There's no point in questioning the science. The science may be uncertain, but the science also leaves you, I hope I've persuaded you, with the need for doing something about this problem. Exactly what we do is not clear. We need compromises. Uh, in the past, it's, it's not as if we're inexperienced with this. We've, science is all about debates and arguments. And so we've debated many things. We debated whether Earth is round or flat. And in retrospect, that was strictly a scientific issue. Like your life is not affected by whether <laughs> in an ethical way by whether the Earth is round or flat. But there were big debates between Christians and non-Christians about this issue. If you're wondering why the Mediterranean is called the Mediterranean, it literally means middle of the earth. It's because the Bible says that Jerusalem, no, Jerusalem I think, is in the center of the earth. And the, I can talk about it afterwards. I think I'm over time. Uh, okay. <laughs> Anyway, the, the, the debate about the Earth around the flat is an interesting one in that the Greeks proposed that the Earth is symmetrical, that there will be continents in the southern hemisphere similar to those in the north. There will be people in the south and in the north. They, and everybody had a great admiration, respect for the Greeks. However, the Greeks also said the equator will be so hot you couldn't cross it. So they simply, if you travel from Athens to Cairo and go further south, it gets hotter and hotter. So they just inferred the equator would be exceptionally hot. So if the Greeks are right, 
and there are, so this is symmetrical, there are people in the south, then they could not have been on Noah's Ark, and therefore the earth must be flat. <laughs> and so there are actually maps from the Middle Ages in which the earth is flat and the equator goes through the Mediterranean, and it was called the middle of the earth. And anyway, we tie ourselves up into knots, and in the end, what difference does it make if the earth is flat or round I mean, to your spiritual life? Uh, similarly, uh, about is the earth at the center of the universe or not? It's not clear that that's an ethical issue. Again, it's counter to what the Bible says, but not necessarily. Uh, I would argue that this issue is different, the global warming one. It is an ethical issue, okay, uh, that it's not just a matter of science. Uh, I recommend you read Tragedy of the Commons by Garrett Harding, which he so points out the limitations of science. It, it, it does not answer all questions. And so I will sort of say that Gordon and Crichton disagree, uh, mostly for political reasons. If you read the appendix in Crichton's book, it's clear that uh, he won't accept that global warming is fact, simply because he doesn't trust the government to do the right thing <laughs> if it happens. It's mostly political, the disagreement. It's not really about the science. The, what would the Nelson Mandela perspective be? Uh, I mean, he, he'd know that Martin Luther King inspired people by saying, I have a dream. And so he'll be somewhat skeptical of environmentalists to tell you about their nightmares. Right? Terrible things are going to happen in Florida. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you don't, but you must be tired, sick and tired of hearing about this. Uh, from a Mandela perspective, uh, we should be positive. And we should use global warming as a key to education. And uh, we live on this very, very special planet. As I said, it's the only one in the universe known to be habitable. And what I would hope is that th this is also a source for boosting self-confidence. We were chosen to be here. We have a responsibility. We should take care. So I'm hoping that if you're concerned about global warming, you want to do something. It's not out of fear, that it's more out of love for the planet. And uh, as I said before, you cannot really love something unless you know it. And so in the same way that we expect every educated person knows about the human body, knows about heart, liver, lungs, knows about hygiene, exercise, diet, in the same way it, it, it's shameful that most people do not know why the planet is habitable. Uh, I think it should be it's our responsibility to teach children from grade school upwards. In the same way to teach them about the human body, we should teach them about the planet. Why is this such an exceptional planet? Uh, in the end, should you be a hedgehog or a fox? So science is basically a hedgehog activity. Right? There are very firm rules and you have to abide by those. Um, social problems need a fox. And so I'll conclude with Kenny Rogers, the philosopher. <laughs> If you like, we can listen to his song. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>